character. Yes. Oh, she talks to me. That's cool. Did you guys hear her? Did you guys hear the little lady? Anyway, um, what a friendly little computer. Um, now I am recording. Um, I'm going to try to record each one of these lectures and then post them to YouTube so that you can go back and review. And if you miss a day, God willing, um, you can go back and review. Now, don't be going, hey, I don't have to go to class because I can go back and watch the recording. You're still going to be counted absent on my little sheet if you're not here live and in person. So be here live and in person. Now, if you have to miss, if you get sick, if you get the Rona or something, sure, uh, you can uh, you can go back and watch later. Or if you want to review before an exam or something like that, you can go back and watch. Um, but be here at class on time. So, Okay, now let's see if I can uh, share screen. I've got my Give me just a second. I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint. Okay, what is it? You guys see that? Can you all hear me? Okay, you guys must have muted your sound. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, thank you. Um, we're a small class, so I might um, ask questions. We might have dialogue or more than normal um, for my classes. You guys know I'm kind of a guy that prattles on and doesn't really do a lot of uh, interaction. Uh, but I probably will um, for, for this. Um, can you see me too, or do you just see my Proverbs? We can see you. You're like in a little box in the corner. Yeah, okay. we yeah. can see you. Okay, so I can still make faces. Cool. Okay, now in your notes, question: Do you have your notes with you? Um, what is what is at the top of the page? Can someone show me what's at the first page? Not the cover, but like table of con the table of contents. Okay, flip it. What's after the table of contents? Proverbs uh, was lesson one. Okay, that's what I was afraid. I was afraid that, that you didn't have this stuff. Um, and, and I'll what I'll do is I'll make a handout um, of the material I'm going to cover right now and send it to you since I was afraid it wasn't in the notes. Because when I originally taught the class, I explained it, but I didn't have anything on my cool PowerPoint. So today I'm going to. Now, before we start, though, I would I am going to pray. So does anybody have uh, any prayer requests that they would like to to share if we're going to pray here in a minute yeah kendall i have one okay uh my parents and my sister carlin are currently in albania and at the end of the week they'll be coming back and leaving her there to work with a missionary family there so please pray for her as she spends a year there and then pray for them as they travel back at the end of this week wow a year Whew. so the girl has gone on to the mission field well that's awesome um uh, i've got one too kendall um just me being down here in kentucky uh, uh just pray that everything works out because i'm trying to get a job and everything and i just want to make sure that it lines up with um my schooling and I'm um, trying to build relationships down here. Just pray that that goes well. Um, and also, um, Kirk, Amanda, and Gracie have COVID. Oh, so um, you gotta be kidding me. pray that uh, especially Gracie will be uh, all right through this. Thanks for the heads up on that. I didn't know that. All right, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Um. Father, you are gracious and good, um, and we trust you. But Lord, sometimes uh, we don't understand why we have to go through trials, and it just seems like Kirk and Amanda and Gracie have been through a lot this year, and um, I love them so much, Lord. I, I just pray you would heal them of COVID, especially little Gracie, and you'd protect them. And I pray, God, that 
whatever lesson you're teaching them, they would learn and be able to move on from uh, the trials that they're going through. I thank you for Kirk and Amanda and their friendship and their ministry to your kingdom. And I just pray you bless them. Pray be with Chris down there in Kentucky that he'd acclimate, get a job. And um, and uh, I pray you be with uh, Braden and Ethan's sister that you would watch over her in Albania and that you would um, protect her and uh, that you would help her to minister to people there. Um, it's a scary thing to have your young person go off on their own and she's going into such a vastly different world. And I just pray God that you would guard and protect her and keep her safe and shelter her and uh, that uh, no evil would befall her, but that she would be able to make a difference in people's lives. I pray God, as we study Proverbs today, that we come to a deeper and richer understanding and that um, it would minister to us and we would use the deep wisdom and truth that we come to understand to minister to others better. I pray you bless each one of these young men on their journey to, towards ministry and their journey towards understanding and um, that they would be guided and led by you. Pray you'd help me to do a good job, God, to, to share these truths. And um, we're going to kind of jump in the deep end. And I just pray, God, that you would help me to um, facilitate a really um, encouraging and uplifting uh, study of these ancient wisdoms. In the name of Jesus, I pray for your grace and blessing in our lives. Amen. Okay. We are going to start off, uh, before we get into chapter one, explaining some things about Proverbs. Do, do any of you remember me talking in other classes? Because I mentioned this in other classes, this teaching before, about chiasms and bifeds. Does anybody remember that? If somebody knows what a chiasm is, speak up and say. <laughs> okay. Well, I better explain it again. What tree is in the middle? Okay, here is a chiasm. Can you see this? You guys can see this? Um, this is one that Jesus yeah. says in Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So it makes an X. The Greek letter for X is chi. <laughs> so that's what they call it, a chiasm. It's, it's this thing that it's a, a weird parallelism. And this is just one phrase, okay? This is just a Jesus piece of wisdom. But this sort of speaking was common in their wisdom literature, okay? And and you're going to need to know what a chiasm is. And you're going to need to know what a biofed is for the exam, by the way. So that's why I'm going to send you notes on this. But pay attention to this. Write it down if you're taking notes. Really, I know this isn't in your notes notes, but you're going to be tested on it in the middle of the semester. When we get to October or whenever the middle of the semester is, and you the very first question on that essay exam is, define for me in one sentence what a chiasm is, and define for me in one sentence what a bifed is. I guarantee you that's on the exam, okay? Um, so that's what a chiasm, and Jewish poetry loves to do this kind of symbolism, okay? Now, when we rhyme in poetry, uh, we'll say, uh, Roses are red and violets are blue. You know, we we rhyme with the number of syllables and to make the syllables at the end of the lines rhyme. So uh, two lines of poetry in English, our English poetry, you know, it'll have the same number of syllables and then it'll have uh, a rhyming phonetically at the end, right? Now, if you're really good, okay, you're, you know, Edgar Allan Poe quality poetry or a modern day version would be Eminem, who is the master of this as a rapper. You, they'll also rhyme at the beginning of words, okay? And that's called alliteration. Um, a lot of times preachers use alliteration in sermon outlines where the beginning of each word uh, starts with the same letter or sound. Uh, that's alliteration. 
rhyming at the end of the word, you know, is what we're used to. But sometimes the rhyme at the word, and some people get really good at poetry and they'll have the syllables going and they'll have a whole bunch of stuff rhyme at the beginning of the, that's part of English poetry. Jews would do that too. They also would rhyme and have the same number of syllables and they would have um, the same number of, uh, and they would have it rhyme at the end. But sometimes they would rhyme at the beginning of words, they would have alliteration. And because we don't speak Hebrew, and Greek, um, a lot of times we miss alliteration that's used a lot. And we miss some puns. You guys know what puns are, where you use a word that sounds like another word and you make a pun. There's a bunch of that in the Bible. In fact, God puts more puns in the Bible than my dad put in his jokes. And my dad was a punny guy. Um, I mean, God is like obsessed with puns in, in Hebrew literature. Um, but, you know, it, you're like, well, that's a dad joke. Well, he is the father of us all. Of course, he's going to tell the ultimate dad jokes as our father in heaven. So the chiasm is a form of structure, though, that they would use in their poetry. Now, they wouldn't just do a chiasm in one-liners like Jesus. Sometimes they would do it in a paragraph. This is Joshua, and I hope you guys can see this. This is from Joshua chapter 1 verses five through nine can you all read that is that big enough to be legible yeah yes. okay thank you josh so um he says as i was with moses i will be with you i will never leave you or forsake you that's line a line b be strong and courageous be strong and very courageous line c be careful to obey all the law that you may be successful line d do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth Meditate on it day and night. Okay? So keep it in your mouth and in your mind. That's the middle. Then C, be careful to do everything written in it that you may be prosperous and successful. Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's a chiasm. Okay? So when Joshua wrote this, he was speaking it in a, in a poetic form. Now, does anybody want to guess why so much of the Old Testament not just the books of poetry, you know, the traditional books of poetry are Job um, and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They are literally poems, okay, as is much of Lamentations. But even other books, books of history, books of the law, are written with poems in it. Does anybody want to guess why did the Old Testament use so much poetic structure? Yeah, go for it. Because it was traditionally orally read. So it's a lot easier for it to be something smooth, like a poem, than just a uh, large uh, cacophony of just words. Right. That's one so thing. not everybody could have a book. You couldn't print a book easy as pie. They didn't have photocopiers. Uh, it took, it took um, these scribes years to transcribe the Bible, to get it accurate, to get it perfect. And so a Bible was very, or a scroll, was very expensive. They couldn't afford this. And so God had to make it easily memorable. And as you guys know, when something's written in poetic form, it's easier to memorize. And also, it makes it beautiful to listen to. Poetry has beauty to it, you know? Um, that's why we enjoy music so much. That's why we enjoy poetry so much, is the artistic uh, manner and the, the symmetry is beauty you think about that um if a person's eyes and nose and mouth are in the correct proportion and they're not crooked and cross whatever that's what creates beauty a beautiful woman is a woman whose features are in proportion in fact scientists have even been able to say this is the proportion that people find beautiful they've been able to define beauty based on its proportional um, you guys remember Sloth, right? On uh, the old movie from the 80s, you know, uh, he was all mangled and his his eyes were all crooked and stuff, and he's really ugly. Somebody whose eyes are too big and their faces, too, they're, they're not going to be attractive. What causes beauty is symmetry and the correct proportions. And so when you put words and thoughts into with symmetry of thought, it creates a beauty and it aids in understanding and defining. And so here, this chiasm is teaching you something. It's teaching you this, this truth. Uh, another example 
of the chiasm in the New Testament. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. See how that's a chiasm? See how line A and line A match? Line B and line B match? And line C matches, okay? Um, that's what a, what a chiasm is all about. And the center of a chiasm in the Jewish mind, the center is the main point. For example, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and 6 is a chiasm. In chapter 5, verses 8 through 12, it talks about the pointlessness of pursuing wealth. And in chapter 6, verse 7 and 9, it talks about the pointlessness of pursuing wealth. In um, chapter 5, verses 13 through 17, it talks about evil of not enjoying life. And in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, it talks about the same thing. But then in chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, in the middle of the chiasm, it talks about the blessings of basking in God's gifts. And so some people in the English mindset, in our Western mind, we read a poem and we think that the main point is at the end, right? Like so many times in, in our stories, we think linearly. It's just the way the Western mind thinks. But that was not necessarily where the Eastern, Middle Eastern mind thought. For them, the main point was in the center. You walked up to it and then you walked away from it. That's what a chiasm does. So the, the main point is we should bask in God's blessings. There's a pointlessness to wealth. And um, life can be really evil and unenjoyable when things are taken from you. But the main point is God gives us blessings and we should enjoy those while we have them. And so if you read that with a, a Western mindset, you would miss the main point because you would think the main point is life is worthless and, and pointless when that's not the main point. The main point is even though wealth, pursuing wealth is pointless, and, and even though life can be unenjoyable away from God, that when you're right with God and you're under God's blessings, life becomes enjoyable. And so to, what it's teaching is, to find meaning in life, so your life isn't pointless and meaningless, don't chase wealth, don't chase pleasure, get a relationship with God. And so the whole point of Ecclesiastes could be lost if you tried to make, you know, the final summation, uh, chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. So um, the center is often the main point. Uh, the same thing can be said in books um, or or. We're going to use an example from Proverbs. So one of the Proverbs that we'll talk about at the very end is uh, chapter 30 and 31, where it talks about the value of a good wife, right? So um, chapter um, 10 says the high value of a good wife. And then it says it again in, in verses 30 and 31. Verses 11 through 12 says, husband benefited by wife. And the same idea is found in verses 28 and 29. The wife works hard, 13, 19, and verse 27. The wife gives to the poor. That's, you know, um, and um, the wife speaks wisdom. See, she's giving. She works hard. She's giving to people. Um, no fear for the future. No fear for snow. Uh, the wife is clothed. In dignity, the children are clothed in scarlet. Uh, she sells garments and sashes. She has coverings for bed. And she's, she has the clothing that she needs to provide for family. And then the middle, the middle uh, public respect for her husband. So what is this teaching us, the benefit of a good wife? You see, it puts the center right there. It leads up to that thought, and then it leads back away from it. That the whole structure, and you might read that if you were just casually reading Proverbs and not get it. So what I want to suggest to you is though we might, and this is the way I always viewed Proverbs. I thought Proverbs was just like a bucket, okay? And that the author of Proverbs just said, oh, here's some Proverbs. And he was just tossing Proverbs in a bucket randomly. And I thought Proverbs was just a random collection of wise sayings. I didn't think there was any structure to it. I didn't think that I had no idea. I read chapter 31 dozens of times. You guys got to understand that for years, <laughs> I mean years, um, I had heard Lee Mason 
uh, the former president of the CRA speak at Wabash at a church when I was just young. And I, he was there for revival, and I went over to hear him speak. And he had suggested, whilst he was preaching from Proverbs, reading a chapter of Proverbs a day. I'm in Bible college, and I thought, well, that's a good idea. So I started doing it. And for years, I mean years, whatever day of the month it was, I read that chapter of Proverbs. So that I was, you know, hiding away in my heart the wisdom of God. And um, a lot of the fruit of my study um, of Proverbs is because of the absolute familiarity with it. Uh, from reading it again and again and again and again and again. And that's why I'm trying to encourage you to read a chapter a day from Proverbs because it will transform your understanding of Proverbs and of God's will for your life. Okay. So, um, that's what chiasms are. Um, now, there's not just chiasms. Now, no, no, hold on. Before we move on from this, I want you to notice that a chiasm is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then G, F, E, D, C, B, A. So it just goes up and backwards. That's a chiasm, okay? Where it leads up to a point and then back. That's a chiasm. Not all patterns in Old Testament poetry are chiasms. Chiasms are the ones that creates the X, okay? It goes up to a point and back. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about bifeds, where that's where it goes A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. It repeats the pattern. It doesn't go up and then go backwards. It just repeats the pattern. That's a bifed. And then there are other patterns that don't have names that are like super complicated. So um, look for patterns. Um, it could be A, B, A, B, C, A, B, A, B, C, that kind of thing. Or the pattern might be A, B, A, C. A D, A E, A F, or so forth. One of the things when I was taking a Jewish poetry class uh, when I was in college with my professor Daniel Dyke, who much of the understanding of this really I owe to Dan Dyke and his knowledge. He went to Princeton and studied Hebrew and anyway, his much of my knowledge of this I owe to Professor Dyke. And he had us as an assignment it's probably something i should have done in this class nah, that's all right anyway um another class um if i ever teach uh psalms i will do this but he had us go through the psalms he wasn't talking about proverbs necessarily but he had us go through psalms and he had us take a psalm and we would read a line of, of psalms of one of the psalms and we would assign the letter a to it and then we look through the psalm and anywhere else that had that similar idea reset the same idea said with different words or even with the same words we put an a beside it then we go back to the first line that wasn't an a thought and label it b and then search through the whole proverb or not proverb but psalm and look for the thought b and put a b beside it and so we would couple it and we would see patterns and sometimes it was a b c d uh, and then it would go backwards it was a chiasm sometimes it was a bifed a b c d f a b c d f Sometimes it was like these patterns you see here, A, B, A, B, C, A, B, A, B, C. Um, and sometimes it would be A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E. It would repeat back. Different Psalms had different patterns. And then what I noticed as I did several of them is some of them were really complicated, but there was a rhythm to it. It was like A, B, B, C, D, A, A, B, B, C, D, A, A, B, B, C, D, A. It was like, it was like a rhythm. It was like a drum. It was like, you know, it was what it was seemed like random wasn't. So you guys, this for me is a huge apologetic. Okay. Cause when you think, and then the other thing that Jews like to do in their poetry uh, is they like to take the lines and make them an acrostic. And there is an acrostic in the book of Proverbs. We'll talk about it when we get to it, but that, uh, uh, Psalm 119, if you guys are familiar with Psalm 119, written by King David, longest chapter in your Bible. The reason it's the longest chapter is because it goes through the entire Hebrew alphabet as an acrostic. They're A, it has like four lines with A, four lines with B, four lines with C, or their version of said letters. And it goes through 
and talks about God's word. So each line is the same number of syllables. The end of those lines are rhyming. There's alliteration in that each line, four lines, starts with the same letter and then goes through the alphabet talking about the wisdom of God and it goes through all of their alphabet and it's this huge long thing and then it has these similar ideas repeating themselves so it's got a pattern to it and on top of that it was written to music and it was sung you guys when it gets that complicated you start going no human could come up with where do, how do you have the intelligence to do that and some of them become so complicated, so intricate, so detailed, so perfect that you're like, that's the fingerprint of God on it. That's like, that's inspired. He's like, how in the world did a shepherd boy, uneducated shepherd boy come up with that? How in the world? And so, you know, you really just start to see uh, the amazing nature of Jewish poetry. It's very complicated. Um, let's talk about bifeds. Uh, it's a pattern repeated, but not reverse, like a chiasm. So A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. And so um, here's some examples. Um, this is the book of Isaiah. You're like, wait a second, Kendall, there are a whole book. Yeah, the whole book of Lamentations is a chiasm. The whole book of Isaiah is a bifed. Um, in fact, um, the ironic thing is Isaiah, according to tradition, was killed for being a prophet. And does anybody know how they killed him? Do anybody know what the Jewish tradition is on how Isaiah died? It's not in the Bible, but. It... Saw him in half. That's right. And James talks about how some of the prophets were cut in two. Well, we think it was Isaiah. But the ironic thing is modern scholars try to say that isaiah wrote the first half of, of his book but the second half was written by another author later on because it makes so many predictions that come true and they tried to say isaiah was written by the second half of isaiah was written by christians because it predicts jesus's death the problem is now we have copies of the dead sea scrolls that predate christ's birth by a couple hundred years so that can't be true but it's funny to me that in ancient times the evil people who rejected Isaiah cut him in half and the modern ones that reject him cut his book in half. But anyway, part of the reason that they cut it in half is because it's biphetic in structure. So chapters one through five and 34 through 35 talk about the ruin and restoration of Israel. Uh, chapters six through eight and chapters 36 through 40 talk about biographical information. 9, 12 and 41 through 45 talk about blessings and judgments. Um, 1323 and 46 to 48 talk about Gentile nations, 24, 27, and 49 through 55 talk about redemption and deliverance. Uh, 28 through 31 and 56 through 59 talk about ethics and sermons. And then 32 through 33 and 60 through 66 talk about the restoration of Israel. So the book is absolutely parallel in its, instru in its uh, structure. So sometimes it's just a one-liner from Jesus that's a chiasm or a bifed. Sometimes it's just a little paragraph. Sometimes it's a chapter, like in chapter 31. And sometimes it's a whole thinking book. It has this structure. And sometimes it's all of those, where there's portions in it and larger portions and bigger portions that are all these bifeds, chiasms, and stuff mixed in together. I mean, you guys, we're not dealing with a normal book of literature here. We're not dealing with normal human authors. We're dealing with a level of sophistication and authorship that's really beyond human ability. And the more you study and the deeper you study the Bible, the more you're going to realize this has the finger of God on it. It is inspired literature. Um, there's a lot of acrostic poetry. Um, Psalms 9, Psalms 10, Psalm 25, Psalm 34, Psalm 37. Uh, Psalm 111, Psalm 112, Psalm 119. I, I said eight verses. I guess I was uh, four verses. Actually, I should have said eight. It's eight verse. That, that's even more complicated. And Psalm 145, one verse. So these um, uh, 
Psalms are written as acrostic poetry, and the level of intricacy is amazing. Um, we already talk about Psalm uh, 31 and how it was written as uh, a uh, chiasm. Well, not only was it a chiasm, it was also acrostic. So you think about that. It's got this thing about women. It's the same number of syllables per line. They rhyme at the end. It's using alliteration in it. It's a chiasm with one main thought in the middle. And then each line begins with a different lever, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's stinking amazing. And it's an amazing chapter. So my method with Proverbs. Um, when you get dad's book on Proverbs and most other studies on the book of Proverbs, because it's seemingly random and because it's extensive and long book, when somebody wants to cover it, usually they cover it topically. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, here's everything Proverbs says about marriage. Here's everything Proverbs says about sex. Here's everything Proverbs says about money. Here's everything Proverbs says about anger. Here's everything Proverbs says about forgiveness. Here's everything Proverbs says. And that's the way dad approached the book of Proverbs. And when you read dad's notes, and, and I want you all to read them, you're going to go through the book of Proverbs topically. That's 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 a cool way to do it. But I was really wanting to try a different approach. Back in 2011, uh, I was going to do a home Bible study for my church on Proverbs. And Dad was wanting me to teach it for Summit. And one of the first classes I ever taught at Summit, uh, I believe, was the book of Proverbs. And I think I taught it again in, in 12. And um, I'm not sure how many times I've taught Proverbs now. I've taught it multiple times. But what I did is I divided it up into sections. Now, most of those sections were actually at the chapter divisions because whoever it was in the Middle Ages who divided up the book of Proverbs into chapters um, did a fairly decent job of going with the natural divisions uh, of the thoughts and the sections because it is different sections. It wasn't all written at once. It was a compilation of sayings of different people so some of them are, and the vast majority of them, are from Solomon. Uh, and that's something you're going to need to know who wrote the book of Proverbs, mostly Solomon and his ancestors. Um, some of them are, are from these other kings, which we're not sure who they are. Many people think it were nicknames or pseudonames for Solomon, um, but uh, which would be interesting because it'd be very interesting to think that the person giving the motherly advice at the end of Proverbs is actually Bathsheba. But anyway, because um, that would make Bathsheba in a, pretty much an, almost an inspired author of the scripture. Um, so um, we're going. what I did though, uh, and in like chapter 21, 22, 23 in that area, the chapter divisions aren't in good places um, because that's where the acrostic is and it didn't divide it up well. And so when we get to those chapters where the chapter division is not in a good location, I won't just do a chapter. I'll actually do a section from a halves of a couple chapters. But I tried to divide it up uh, from my understanding of it in the logical, natural divisions of the book. And then what I did is I assigned each thought a letter. Remember how I told you when I read through Proverbs, I would sign line one of a, not Proverbs, but I, when, I, when I was studying psalms thank you very little there it is psalms when i was in college i would go through a psalm and assign letter a and then letter b and letter c to the the ideas and that's how i studied psalms i decided hey it's true of job it's true of ecclesiastes it's true of uh psalms it's true of the other wisdom literature even song of solomon why wouldn't it be true of proverbs Proverbs is technically poetry as well. Maybe there's a structure to Proverbs I don't I didn't see. And so whereas I'm not going to focus on the rhythms, I did find similar ideas where there were repeating themes within these divisions where there's you can you can get a sense of structure. And so what I've done is I'm going to go chapter by chapter, not always chapter, sometimes 
a couple chapters together or a chapter and a half or two half chapters, whatever. I'm going to go through these sections and I'm going to compile all the similar ideas on a topic. That way we're seeing how the different proverbs work together. Because whereas you might have one understanding if the proverbs all by itself, when you see it in harmony with the other things around it and you see the deeper structure, you come to a better understanding of the proverb. And so I'm going to present the material to you based on topic within chapters or these natural divisions. Does, does everybody understand what I'm saying? If there's anybody that doesn't understand, I want to re-explain so you understand how I did it. Just are you questions? saying that you're are you saying that you've set up the class in this uh poetic structure, or are you just um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Is I'm gonna go through I'm gonna go through I'm gonna go through chapter or chapter or natural division by natural division, mostly chapter by chapter. And I'm going to show you how that within those there are common themes within those, and I'm gonna dwell on each one of those themes with you. Now, the first two chapters were super easy because they are less a little one-liner proverbs. Really, it's not till chapter three that you really get into the seemingly random one-liners. So in chapter one and two, you're going to be like, well, yeah, those are obviously themes. Yeah, because because the themes are more obvious because it's not just a collection of little one-liners. But as we get in, get into chapter three, even in five and six, when it gets into the stuff about adultery, the themes are easier to pick out. But as we go through the book, you read a chapter and you think, well, there's no rhyme nor reason to this chapter. That's what I used to think. And I was wrong. And what we're going to try to do is discover together the rhyme nor reason, the rhyme and reason for each chapter. Okay. And as we get into it, I hope it, it'll become clear. But basically, we're going to go verse by verse almost through the entire book of Proverbs, we're going to go chapter by chapter anyway, through the book of Proverbs and cover literally every concept of every proverb, only we're going to do it thematically. But instead of like dad, where he would do the whole book, every verse that says something about it, we're going to do it within these chapter divisions because they fit together better. Okay. So today I'm going to have, uh, we're going to be in prop chapter one. You could go to chapter one now. We're going to actually be where your notes start. So you can open up your notes now uh, that you've got, uh, your, your book that you've got of notes. You can open that up. And we're going to we're going to do that. As the class goes on, I'm not always going to have on, on the screen uh, the Proverbs. When I first started teaching the class, I put it up there and read it off the screen. But then as, as time got on, I kind of got away from that. So um, what's going to happen eventually is at the start of a chapter, I will read through the whole chapter with you, okay? And if it's not a chapter division, if it's a half chapters or section, I'll read that section to you. And then we'll go back and talk about it. And we'll go through each of the things within it uh, and cover it. But these, it lends itself to doing section by section instead of the whole chapter. Because as I said, chapter one and chapter two are much more easily outlined and structured, more obviously structured than the rest of Proverbs, okay? So um, I am actually, I've got 1.30 here, so it's 2.30 there, right? Let's go ahead before we start this section, and we're a little early. We're not quite an hour yet, um, but we'll go ahead and take our uh, five-minute break right now. You guys can go to the bathroom, get a drink or whatever, and then we'll dive into chapter one, okay? So go ahead and... Um, and take a break, and we'll be back in five minutes, okay? All right.
recording. All right, now I'm recording again. Yay. I figured out how to resume my uh, Zoom. Okay. We are, I need to go ahead and put on the screen, share. So uh, you can go in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter one. You can turn in your notes to chapter one. And uh, let's read verses one through six together as we start our journey. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So there you go. Now we already know. Uh, question number one, if you were taking the quiz, who wrote Proverbs? Uh, there's the answer to that. Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, wrote Proverbs for the gaining wisdom, instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, and doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple knowledge and discretion to the young, to let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables and the sayings and the riddles of the wise. So the question is, who needs proverbs? Well, it tells us who. The simple. Now, what does it mean simple? Well, that means a person who's who's foolish. Basically, the idea of simple is the person who only looks at face value. If you only listen to what a politician says and you don't look for the underlying motives, if you if you I don't forget politician, if you get married someday and you only listen to the words your wife says and not the underlying facial expressions and reactions of your wife, you just simple minded. You stupid, you know? Because how many times are, is everything all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Now, if you just listen to the words, she said she was fine. What's the problem? Look, guys, if she says she's fine, she's not fine. Okay. Don't be simple. The book of Proverbs is for people who are simple in their mind. Now, let me stop right here with any idea that Proverbs, that simple and discerning is about IQ. Because it's not. Okay? So each one of us who are in this class have various levels of IQ. If we took an IQ test, some of you might score astoundingly high and some of us uh, others might score average or even below. But that has nothing to do with wisdom. Wisdom is not based on your ability to remember information. Wisdom is your ability to put to use the information that you have. See, there's a difference between being ignorant and being stupid. <laughs> If you're ignorant, you just don't know something. For example, about computers, networks, and everything, I'm pretty ignorant. You know, uh, Boomer would know a lot more about computer networks than probably all of us. Uh, I don't know. Maybe one of Jason's kids have been taught the ways of their father, but I, you know, like I don't know anything about. Now, does that mean I'm stupid? No, I'm not stupid. I just I've never learned. There's a difference between not knowing and not being able to comprehend. And wisdom, likewise, is the, is the application. The greatest example of this I can give is Forrest Gump. Have you all seen, is anybody who hadn't seen Forrest Gump, the movie? You've all seen it, right? Okay, you all seen it. All right. Remember what Forrest used to say? Stupid is as stupid does. Right? What's he saying? In other words... You're not stupid. Now, um, let me ask you a question. Jenny, his beloved Jenny, who wastes her life on drugs and abusive men and eventually gets AIDS and dies, she, she had a much higher IQ than Forrest Gump. Am I right? But she had bad parents who didn't teach her wisdom, who abused her. Whereas Forrest had a good mama who even though he was slower in a box of rocks, 
uh, he implemented wisdom because she taught him to be wise. Um, and so actually, like one of the points I get from the Forrest Gump movie is Forrest Gump was slow. Wasn't that high of an IQ, but he was wise. And because he was wise, he was constantly blessed. Because he was wise, he did heroic things. Because he was wise, he was loving to Jenny. And even though Forrest wasn't smart, he was wise. And even though Jenny was smart, she was foolish. And so for me, that's a, a perfect example of what the Bible is talking about. This has nothing to do with your innate God-given intelligence level. We all at birth have certain proclivity of intelligence that we're just DNA wise given. Genetically, we received uh, a certain brain and it has its, you know, blessings and, and its curses. It has its abilities and inabilities. And our brain and our genetic makeup and our physiological makeup, uh, our psychological makeup that we inherited, um, gives us certain abilities and lack. Some of you grew up in good homes. Some of you grew up in abusive homes. Some of you grew up with good parents. Some of you grew up in bad parenting situations. That's going to affect your natural abilities. Um, there's something called not only a mental intelligence, there's emotional intelligence. And a person can have a perfectly good brain, but grow up in an abusive situation with abusive father or mother or whatever, and have an emotional intelligence problem because they weren't loved and treated right. And so it creates them insecurities and problems that they have to struggle through for the rest of their life. And so there's this natural uh, debate in modern science and in the world is uh, the difference between, um, you know, what you're born with and what your environment is. You know, what is it? Is it genetics that determine your fate or is it your cultural upbringing? Is it nature or nurture? That's the, a, a big, huge debate in psychology, nature or nurture. Well, what the Bible suggests and what I believe is the truth is, and the reason that nature and nurture can't always predict, because you can have two people who are twins with the same genetics brought up in the same home who grew up to make vastly different lives, who live totally different lives based on their choices. You see, there's this third thing that influences it called free will. And your nurture and your nature don't determine that. Um, I heard of a of a guy who was talking to two brothers whose father was an alcoholic. One of them grew up to be a Christian minister, and the other one grew up to be an abusive alcoholic like his father. And he went to the alcoholic one, and he said, why are you the way you are? And he said, well, I didn't have a chance. My dad was an alcoholic and abusive, and so I grew up to be like him. I just grew up to be like my dad. And then the other one said, he went to the preacher one. He said, why did you grow up to be a preacher with such a, uh, an abusive parent? Well, my dad was an abusive alcoholic and I didn't want to be like that. So I, I chose a totally different life. You see, same guys, same house, same environment, similar genetics, radically different lives because one chose wisdom and the other chose foolishness. So wisdom Lesson number one, man, if you don't get anything else out of this class, this wisdom is a choice. You choose whether you're wise. You don't get to choose whether you're, you're high IQ or low IQ. You don't get to choose whether you've had good emotional upbringing or a bad emotional upbringing. You don't get to choose that. You don't get to choose who your parents are. You don't get to choose the environment you grew up in. You don't get to choose your genetics. You don't get to choose your brain. You're given what you're given. But that doesn't mean you're wise or you're foolish. You choose to be wise or you choose to be foolish. Jenny, at the end of her life, once she gets AIDS and is dying, she realizes she's made foolish decisions. And finally, at the end of her life, she makes a wise decision. 
And just because you've made foolish decisions in the past doesn't mean you have to keep doing that. Look who Proverbs is for. It's for the simple, for the youth, for the wise. You say, well, I'm already wise. I'm educated in the scriptures. I'm knowledgeable. I'm a Bible college student. Well, whoopee ding dong. You're never done learning. You're never done. When you graduate from Summit, I hope to God you don't stop studying, especially if you go into ministry. I pray to God that you're a student for the, I'm still a student. I joked with you guys in that email and called you my Padawan learners, but I'm still a Padawan learner. I'm still being taught by people. I'm still being taught on how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, how to now how to be a grandfather, how to be a good preacher, how to be a good person, you know, every in every way, my finances, every part of my life, I'm still learning. One of the reasons I love teaching Proverbs so much is it reminds me and refreshes me again on all this wisdom, I get to dive deep and swim around in wisdom for 16 weeks. It's such a blessing. I'm going to get as much out of this as you are. Because here's we're going to learn later that wisdom is something you have to keep refreshing. You don't get it, and then you get to keep it. it it's something that will slip away if you don't use it and think on it and dwell on it. You can't, you don't go, you don't read Proverbs one time and go, well, I got that taken care of. Now I'm wise for the rest of my... No, it doesn't work that way. Proverbs is something you have to seek for the rest of your life. Wisdom isn't something you seek once or you do once. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on. I don't want to give away all my cool points from the future. But it's for the wise to make them wiser. Here's the thing, guys. You're not done yet. This is That's one of my biggest things I harp on with my church. You're not there yet. You're not everything God wants you to be. You don't know everything. You're not you're not done. If you see yourself as complete, perfected, first of all, you're stupid. And second of all, you're going to stagnate. You know there's some things in your life you need to change. I mean, if you're honest, there's some things you need to learn and you need to change. And you better figure out what they are and start addressing them. And that's what the book of Proverbs is good for. The book of Proverbs is good for exposing where you're thinking wrong, where you're believing wrong, where you're doing wrong. It corrects, rebukes, encourages, trains so that you're thoroughly equipped. The book of Proverbs is powerful. And it's for the discerning. Even a person who has a lot of discretion, the older, wise, mature person, there's still stuff in Proverbs for you. So what's the answer? Who's Proverbs for? Everyone, the Proverbs is for you. There is something in this for you. If you read this book and you listen to this class and you don't get anything out of it, that's on you. Because there is there are many, many things. There are little nuggets of truth and, and wisdom and uh, encouragement and rebuke in this book for you. And if you don't take them to heart and put them into practice, that's on you. It doesn't have to do with your IQ. It doesn't have to do with your background and your upbringing. It's not nature nor nurture. It's you choosing to pursue wisdom or not pursue wisdom. So wisdom is not given through osmosis. Wisdom is not, you're not born wise. None of you came out of your mama's wombs wise. In fact, we're going to learn you come out of your mama's womb foolish. You're born without it and you've got to get it. Wisdom has to be acquired. It doesn't come natural, guys. It's not intuitive. It's not instinctive. It's not. If you meet somebody who's wise, it's because they sought it and put it into practice. Um, nobody is accidentally wise. No one. It's not an accident. So what's the source of wisdom, right? We talked about how wisdom's for everybody and everybody needs it. Where do you get it? Look at verse seven with me. Verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching, for they are garland to grace your neck and a chain 
to adorn your neck. So back then they would wear like, you know, you could put a ring of flowers in your hair. They go and put a garland of flowers around your neck. Why would somebody wear a necklace of flowers? Well, it looks pretty. First of all, what's the other thing? It smells nice. And back then, when you were awarded victory, they would put a garland on your head or they put a garland around your neck. A garland was a sign of being victorious. It's So what is the source of wisdom? Well, um, wisdom source is a fear and or respect of God and his wisdom. Wisdom ultimately comes from who? From God. Wisdom is sourced, first of all, from God. Um, a fear and or respect of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. We're going to see this concept. This isn't the only verse that's going to say this. It says it's the beginning of knowledge and it's the beginning of wisdom. You don't know what you need to know till you know that the only place that's a sure source of wisdom is God. If you're looking for wisdom merely in creation or in yourself or in human teachings and you have no fear of God, you're just stuck on stupid. You can't be wise. You can be knowledgeable. You can have a high IQ. You can have a very high IQ. In fact, some people with really high IQ struggle with being wise because they become arrogant with their massive intelligence. Do you guys know that Bill Clinton had a genius IQ? That when Bill Clinton would take IQ tests, he he scored as a genius. He was a Rhodes Scholar. You don't get that without testing genius level on your IQ. But was he wise? No. I mean, the choices he made in his personal life and the things he did, they were downright evil. Uh, you know, um, if the multiple women witnesses are to be believed, he's a rapist. We know he cheated on his wife in the Oval Office. I mean, and made terrible political choices, was for killing babies. I mean, he he was he's foolish. He made foolish choice. Hanging out with uh, Epstein on Pedophile Island, which he did, we know. That wasn't wise, guys. High IQ? Yes. High wisdom? No, he was foolish. Very foolish. Because he had no respect for God. He had no fear of God or answering to God. And that's the beginning of wisdom. So number one, you have to realize wisdom comes from God. Number two, it comes from father and mother figures. Listening to your father's advice and your mother's advice. Now, I used to just say, listen to your mom and dad. Because they're going to give you wisdom. You guys all know that even bad parents will give good advice, right? Like a dad will be sitting there smoking cigarettes going, you better not smoke, kid. If I catch you smoking cigarettes, I'm going to beat your butt. Here he is smoking cigarettes. Why, if he's smoking, why didn't he want his kid to smoke? Because he didn't want his kid to get addicted like him. Even people who make bad choices will want good things for their own kids. Um, but some of you, and I don't know all of you's backgrounds, some of you might not have had good mom or a good dad. Um, I grew up with a dad giving me great advice and a mom giving me terrible advice. So listening to my mother's instruction, some of the time, was a very bad idea. And now sometimes she gave me good advice. She always wanted to give me a good advice, but she was just mixed up in her beliefs. So I put on there father and mother figures because... If you're a Christian and you don't have, maybe your father has passed away. Maybe you never knew your dad. Maybe you never knew your mom. Maybe maybe you don't have a good father and mother figure uh, in, as far as biological parents. Yeah, but you need that. And if you don't have a father and mother figure in your life that you rely on, you need to find one. If If your dad is not a good source for wisdom, if your dad makes a bunch of foolish decisions and you even know your dad's foolish, then you need to find another man who's a godly man, older than you, that can become a father figure to you in the faith, right? Remember Timothy, the evangelist in the New Testament? His dad wasn't a Christian. Now his mom, uh, Eunice and Lois, his grandmother and mom, they were great. They taught him the Bible, but he needed a father figure. And who did he find? The Apostle Paul. And Paul calls him his son in the faith, Right? So if you're a Timothy without a good dad, or maybe you don't have a good mom figure, 
you need a good mom figure. You know, you need somebody. Now for me, my mom wasn't around in high school. So uh, dad's secretary, Jan Phillips, sometimes played that role. But even more, my my good friend in high school, John Rice, his mom, B, played that motherly role, giving me motherly advice, uh, mothering me. We need that. God gave us a father and a mother because we need them. And if you don't have a good godly father or mother, then find a good godly father and mother figure. Some of you are away at college. Maybe you're away from your mom or dad for the first time in your life. Um, hey, go to church and find somebody in the church that's like that. It can be a grandparent to you or an adoptive mom or whatever. You need people in your life to play that role. You know, um, my dad isn't around anymore. I'm 50 years old. Well, you're grown. You don't need a dad. Well, yeah, man. but I still got, I still got people who are that to me. I got older brothers in the faith. And then I've also got like dad figures like Larry West is a real source, father figure source of guy to me where he is uh, somebody I can turn to for advice, for encouragement, uh, as a listening ear, you need those people in your life. And um, you need everybody needs to be discipling someone, but also everyone needs to be being discipled by someone, whether that's me at 50 or you in your 20s or maybe younger. You need a father, mother figure to give you wisdom. If you don't have it, you need to find a godly man or woman to play that role in your life. If your biological parents don't give good advice, find a godly father, mother figure. And then public appeals, not hidden. So um, wisdom cries out publicly. Wisdom is not uh, the secret wisdom that's only found in the gospel of Thomas, the lost gospel, or in the book of Enoch, that no one accepts his scripture anymore. Or we've got to get the secret knowledge. We've got to go to the Watchtower Society. Or we have to go to the, the Latter-day Saints Council. Or we've got to go to this secret group. Or we're the only ones with the exclusive wisdom and everybody else is going to hell. Look, when you come across people like that, you know they're not. From... Wisdom is out there. It's in the word of God. It's, it's common sense. OK, and so it, it, wisdom makes its appeal publicly. God has, uh, it says in the book of Jude, once and for all, delivered the gospel to the saints. The word of God is out there. It's not hidden anymore. There, there isn't a hidden gospel or a hidden wisdom it is right there in your face going, hey, wake up, <laughs> stupid. You know, it's it's a bright light that the Bible says that the light of the world is coming to the world. The world didn't want to look at it. You ever wake up in the morning and somebody turns on a light and you're like, ah, you're like a vampire or something. Ah. You know, you don't want the light. That's the way some of us are when God comes to us with wisdom. He flips the light bulb on and we're like, no, I did. I want to go back to sleep. And, you know, I want to take the blue pill, you know, whatever. Um, you can't do that. You have to be open to wisdom source. So look at wisdom source. It's going to come from God. It's going to come from a father, mother, or father, mother figures. And it's going to be this public appeal. It's not It's not hidden thing, okay? Verse 10. Read verse 10 with me, please. Is everybody staying awake? Stretch yourself, smack yourself in the face. You know, Kyle, reach over and smack Ethan. Wake him up. There we go. Uh, <laughs> verse 10. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast your lot with us. We'll all share the loot. Okay, so we've talked about what the source of wisdom is the source of wisdom is fear or respect for god father and mother figures the family and public appeals what is the source of foolishness look at verse 15 my son do not go along with them do not set foot on their path for their feet rush to evil they are swift to shed blood 
How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. What's the source of foolishness? Number one, they love simple-mindedness. They like only dealing on the surface. Today, in the media, they don't deal with the nuances of racism or the problems with the economy. They only deal at the surface level, you know? Like, the, the political speech today is, orange man bad, Biden evil. You know, it's little one-liners. It's, it's not dealing at a philosophical level at all, or wisdom. It's the politics of uh, the soundbite uh, or the quick blame for a problem without really dealing with the complexities and the intricacies of the world in which we live. They love simple-mindedness. These are the bad guys and we're the good guys and they're evil. And they, don't, they, don't, they can't even tell you why. They can't even, yeah, they're really, they're really bad. They're, those Republicans are mean. Are those Democrats evil? Why? Well, I don't know. Because TV says so, orange man bad. They, they can't tell you. They're simple-minded. The source of foolishness is television. I mean, simple-mindedness. Okay? Wicked people enticing with selfish motives. Okay? So a simple-minded, foolish appeal is going to be in, to entice. What do we call that today? Advertising. You see the ad of the guy who's drinking the beer and he's got the girl and the friends and it's fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm living the dream. It's Miller time. Yeah, yeah, I love the, you know. And they're like painting a picture in the alcohol commercial of the cool guy who gets the women and has fun with his bros. What's up? What's up? What's up? All these stupid commercials. What are they doing? They're painting a picture and they're enticing you with selfish motives. You'll be the cool guy. You'll get the girl. You'll be the pun, fun party guy if you drink our beer. And is that really the case? What is what is drinking beer really like? It's really getting fat and having a beer belly. It's destroying your liver. It's destroying your brain. It's becoming an addict. It's destroying relationships. It's making your wife hate you. Your kids resent you. Makes you abusive. Makes you a brawler. Makes you a fighter. Makes you an addict. Destroys your success in life. I mean, alcohol destroys lives. But they entice with selfish motives. They tie it to cool people, to musicians and athletes and NASCAR drivers and boxers and people who would never, ever drink alcohol. I mean... Do you think boxers go and drink a bunch of beer before they go out on the mat? But then what's it say on the mat when you look down from above at the boxers? It says right on the mat of the boxing mat, Budweiser. They're not using the product. They're just selling you a lie. And so simple-minded people, it's like um, if you've watched Star Wars, it's like a Jedi mind trick. The simple-minded, these are not the droids you're looking for. I mean, it's just, you got to be dumb and simple-minded to go, if you drink this beer, you'll be cool and popular and have the ladies. How dumb do you got to be? How stupid do you got to be to believe this stuff? Um, If you use this shampoo, you'll be the sexy guy. If you use our aftershave, all the women will throw themselves at you. Um, I see these advertisements all, it's just stupid. And uh, or what about the cologne commercials around Christmas time? Are those not the gayest, creepiest things you've ever seen in your life? It's like some guy on a beach shirtless. And you're like, what is this commercial about? And at the end, it'll be like, Estee Lauder, blah, blah. You know, what the heck is going on? It's simple. It's trying to tie something that you want to a product they want you to sell you. Wicked people entice with false motives. You know, if you... If you vote for us, we'll make your education free and we'll make your health care free and we'll make everything free. The government will pay for everything if you just vote for us. You moron, where do you think the money for the government comes? Where do you think they get their money? 
You think you're not going to be paying for that? Out the nose? This new thing where just yesterday the president gives $10,000 uh, um, forgiveness to people with college loans. Do you know how many more people are going to go into debt now thinking they'll do it again? Do you know how much... Do you know how many do you know how many billions of dollars that is that's getting stuck into the economy? We already have a deflated dollar. Do you know how much that's going to hurt inflation? Do you know how much more expensive now college is going to become? I mean it is the dumbest thing. And the person that's going to hurt the most are low income minorities. That's who it's going to hurt the most. It's absolutely mind-blowingly simple minded to think that that's a good thing but that's what wicked people do that's the source of foolishness they entice with selfish motives you see the righteous person calls you to character to self-responsibility to paying your own way to earning your own way for taking responsibility for your life and for uh, building your own uh, uh life and and making your own way and helping the weak whereas foolish says you'll get free stuff Come with us. You'll get free stuff. We'll all we'll steal it from these other bad people, and we'll all throw our person together. We'll all share everything equal. That's what communism says. That's what socialism says. That's what drug gangs say. It's what every foolish, stupid idea says. Is we'll you know, and then foolishness also involves conspiracies against others. It pits this group against this group. Okay, it's uh. It's the poor people against the rich. It's the worker against the, the corporations. It's the Democrats against the Republicans. It's the Republicans against the Democrats. It's the conservatives against the liberals. It's the Christians against the Muslims. It's, it's constantly pitting people against each other and creating conspiracies. Hey, let's, let's conspire together how we can defeat the other people. It's not a let's create win-win circumstances and get along with each other and take care of each other and love our fellow man and let's help the poor and let's help and let's take personal responsibility. No, no, no. It's pitting you against the evil corporations. It's pitting you against the evil Republicans or the evil Democrats or whoever. It's conspiracy against others. It's the Crips against the Bloods. It's West Coast rappers against the East Coast rappers. It's just stupidity over and over in a million different ways. They've got to get you fighting within yourselves to take control of you. It's the way evil people control you is they create the boogeyman. Here's this group over here that we've got to defeat. Join with us and we'll all join in together. And when we are when we beat them, we'll share all the money. And they de they live on stolen wealth. If a form of gaining wealth and prosperity requires you to take from someone else against their will, it's evil. That's what's wrong with communism. It's what's wrong with socialism. Is right here in chapter one, it's telling you, you cannot get rich stealing from others. That's ill-gotten gain. That's why gambling's wrong, boys. That's why gambling's foolish and stupid and evil, because you're getting rich off of somebody else, taking somebody else's money without earning it. Now, when you take somebody's money because you gave them a good product and you had a you traded a fair product. Now, if you lie, if you tell me, yeah, this car is a real gem and you sell them this piece of junk car that you know is a piece of junk and you get money from that, you're not going to be blessed with that money. That's ill-gotten gain. You stole from them. You lied to them. You deceived them. You hid information from them. You're not going to be blessed in that. But if you trade, if you give somebody a good fair deal and you sell stuff and make a little profit off of your sales, that's good. That's fair. That's right. That's just, that's the kind of money that'll be blessed and that'll last. But when your way of gaining wealth is taking from someone else against their will, forcing them to give you money, that's ill-gotten gain. So you, you ever wonder why communist countries and socialist dictatorships outlaw the Bible? You ever wonder why you can't read the Bible in Russia, communist Russia when or the Soviet Union when they were around or uh, today in modern China? They don't want you reading the Bible. You know why the Bible's banned in North Korea? Because it would teach them that their whole system of government 
is theft. And now the Bible teaches paying taxes, but that's because if a person gives full time to governing, they, they do governmental jobs that they deserve to be remunerated for it. So taxing people enough to pay for government officials to do their legitimate government jobs, that's right. But when we tax so much that we take excess and we redistribute wealth and we give to the poor and we provide health insurance, we provide education, we provide, you know, cradle to grave services for these people, and we force people against their will to give their money and they don't want to, that's theft. That's immoral. It's, it's wrong. Proverbs teaches this, and so does the rest of Scripture, and that's why commies don't want you reading the Bible. And self-defeating philosophy. Um, notice that when you teach and practice these philosophies, they kill. Okay, One of the real clues that homosexuality is wrong is that when you practice it, you die on average seven years earlier. Um, you get AIDS, you get herpes, you get monkeypox and God knows what else um, because it turns out that uh, anal sex was not God's design and you're not designed to do it and it spreads disease really easy because it makes you bleed and it's sick and it's gross and it's wrong and it's not God's design. And when you go against God's design, it kills. And this philosophy of joining together, banding together in a group to go take from someone else, that leads to your own death. Look at the cartel. Look at the drug gangs. Look at the motorcycle, outlaw motorcycle gangs. It all leads to death. Look at Nazism. Look at uh, the Soviet Union. Look at communist China. Mao killed more people than uh, Hitler ever thought about. And so did Stalin. The more command and control the government is, the more it's about taking from people what they work to earn and redistributing it, the more likely that government is to kill you. Um, when you throw your lot in with people who say, let's join together against them and take what they've got and share it amongst ourselves, you are setting up a, a self-defeating philosophy. Uh, as Margaret Thatcher once said, when you make your living by stealing from others, pretty soon you run up out of other people's money to steal. And when a government says, I'm going to steal from the people, the rich people to give it to the poor, you run out of rich people to steal from. Pretty soon, everybody's just poor. You see, in order to grow an economy and gain wealth, people have to work and be productive and produce more than they need. And the only way people ever produce more than they need is if they're in need. And if the government supplies all their needs, they will not work more than they need. And the government, thus, there will not be productivity. There will be not an increase in services and goods. And therefore, there will not be an, an, an increase in capital. And the economy will collapse. It, it, uh, it will collapse. If you don't plant enough corn each year, after a while, you run out of corn. And if you don't plant enough products and services, pretty soon you run out of products and services. And that's what we see happening in the past 15, 20 years in Venezuela very clearly. What was the most profitable and wealthy South American economy quickly went into being the worst simply because they did not listen to Proverbs chapter one. They were simple-minded. They were enticed with selfish motives and free stuff. They followed conspiracies that that uh, capitalism was out to get them. They banded together and attacked innocent people. They shared stolen wealth, but it was a self-defeating philosophy that destroyed their economy. So right off, we're seeing uh, that Proverbs chapter one definitely uh, is teaching us, you know, don't join a drug gang. Don't join a political movement or a brotherhood of guys that say, hey, let's all go in together and take these other people's money. Um, if you do, you are in a self-defeating philosophy that will eventually take your life and destroy everything around you. Verse 20. Um, out, of the, out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. 
Notice, is it a secret conspiracy? Is wisdom the secret thing that you learn and see? No, it's, it's out there. It's for everyone to hear. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will you mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Now, right here, we're, we're getting a couple terms that we're going to see all through the book. Okay, so I want you to look at verse 22. Simple is equated with um, people who hate knowledge. And then it uses the term mocker. Now, this term for mocker, we're going to we're going to read multiple times in the book of Proverbs. And it's a person who they they think they're wise, but they're a fool, as the New Testament says. And they what a mocker does is he mocks wisdom. He mocks at everything. Um, what you'll notice is that when wisdom calls out, she's not insulting. Wisdom isn't. um sarcastic wisdom calls out aloud she raises her voice and she cries out and she says hey this is wisdom this is what we should do but foolishness hates knowledge okay it suppresses knowledge it doesn't want things to be heard wisdom likes free speech wisdom hey everybody let's talk out loud let's all share our thoughts let's debate let's have free speech whereas foolishness hates knowledge you be quiet. You're not allowed to say that. You're not allowed to utter that. Be quiet. And they love simple ways and they mock. Oh, you don't believe in evolution? You're so stupid. You don't believe in global warming? You're anti-science. You don't think you've got to wear a mask? Oh, you're anti-science. You're anti-science. You're anti You're a fool. You're blah, 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 blah. They mock. All you got to do is after the news at night, turn on the television and watch the three late night television shows they're mockers they mock wisdom that's their job they're professional mockers used to be you'd watch late night tv and it was comedians saying funny things and there was entertainment and stuff like that now it's all political it, it's just constant political it wasn't that way when i was a kid there you could watch whole lit now sometimes they would deal with politics but you could watch whole late night shows and there wouldn't be any politics now it's just constant, constant mockery. Look at verse 23. Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. When will God pour out his thoughts? When you repent. You're like, I just don't know what God wants me to do. That's because you're not repenting. Until you repent of your porn addiction, you can't have the wisdom to break your porn addiction. Until you repent of your alcoholism, you can't have the wisdom to break your addiction. Until you repent of sexual immorality, God's not going to show you the way out of it. Until you repent and admit you're doing wrong and thinking wrong, until you repent, you can't find, you can't go to the next level. God's not going to give you wisdom uh, when you don't repent at his rebuke. He already told you this is wrong and you're not listening to him. Why would he tell you more? Why would he give you more wisdom when you don't use the wisdom he gave you? If you want more wisdom, you have to put into practice the wisdom you have. As Paul says, live up to what you've already attained, and then God will teach you more. Until you master the ABCs, you can't learn the sounds of the letters. And until you learn the sounds of the letters, you can't learn to read. And if you want to learn to read without learning the ABCs, it ain't going to happen. You can't learn to read without learning the ABCs. And until you repent of what you already know, he's not going to teach you more. Verse 24, but since you refuse to listen when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. So he's going to mock the mockers. Um. When a calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Notice, wisdom comes from a choice. You guys 
20 years from now will be much wiser or much more foolish. And it won't be because of me and it won't be because of the Bible. It'll be because you chose to fear God and to listen to his word and his instruction and to listen to the spiritual mothers and fathers that God put in your life or and his open teaching, or you chose not to. Wisdom is a choice. You choose whether you're wise or you're a fool. It's on you. Nobody else. I don't get to decide whether you're wise. I only get to decide me. I don't get to decide for my kids. I try to influence them, but I can't decide. Some of you, you have brothers and sisters who are off the rails. That's their choice. You can only choose for you. Um, you've got to, and you've got to choose to do that. Verse 30, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and will be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But in contrast, in other words, whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at peace without fear of harm. Okay, so let's break it down. What is the characteristics of humility versus pride? Wisdom and foolishness, okay? So what I'm going to say here is that the wise person makes humble choices and the foolish person makes prideful choices. Okay, wisdom respects godliness. They want to be like God. They want to seek God. The foolish is simple-minded. They don't want to look deeper. They don't want to study into wisdom. They just want to take things at face value. Whatever lie the devil is telling them. Like Eve, right? If you eat of the fruit, Eve, you'll become a wise like God. You won't die. And you'll become a God. Come on, Eve. Eat it. And she just takes it at face value. Oh, really? Like, totally. Okay. I'm going to totally eat them because... I want to be wise like God. She was simple-minded. She did not respect God's word or God's wisdom. She chased after the simple desire. Wisdom listens to reason and appeal. See, God makes his appeal through reason, logic. Think about it. Meditate on it. Really consider it. Listen to all sides. Listen to this side. Listen to that side. Look at every angle and then make a choice. See, wisdom listens and then reasons out and decides what's the truth. And if you look at and you pray for God to show you, he will. But foolishness hates knowledge. In fact, you, you look at Hitler. He burned books. Look at the Soviets. They burned books. They banned the Bible. And today, what do the fools want to do? They want to ban people from Twitter. They want to ban people from Facebook. They want to uh, ban people from making posts. Oh, that's you know fake news, blah, 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 blah. They want to ban people. One of the ways you can tell a, a, a wise person from a foolish person is a wise person says, okay, Let's talk about it. Let's look at all the both sides of everything and let's make a decision. The foolish person doesn't want both sides, okay? Some people say, do you want creation, not evolution taught in schools? No. I want evolution and creation taught in schools. Because I think when you truly compare both of them, it's obvious that creation is true and evolution is stupid. When you really look at what creation teaches and what evolution teaches, it becomes very clear to me that evolution is unscientific. What I don't want is creationism taught without any critical thinking and explaining why evolution isn't. Like if you get these kids that are homeschooled and they're taught, yeah, we believe in creation, and but they're not taught evolution or why it's wrong. Then when they graduate and they go to college and they hear evolution, they're like, oh, I was lied to because they were never taught both sides. You see, the truth wants to expose everything in the light and wants to look at knowledge. But when you want to hide, that's foolish. We're not going to listen to that. No. Like the Watchtower Society tells the, the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, 
if you read literature, anti-watchtower literature, we'll kick you out of the church. We'll alienate you and, and you'll never talk to your family again. You see, they don't want people to listen to opposing views. One of the signs of truth is it's not afraid of the other side. I'm not afraid of evolution being taught because when you really understand it, I mean, not what they say, but really look at the evidence. It's weak. It's weak. It's absolutely weak. So I'm not afraid. And But when you got people wanting to suppress knowledge, that's that's when you know they're on the, the wrong side. That's one of the signs of foolishness is they hate knowledge. And when you try to tell them, they're like, la, 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 I'm not listening. La, 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 la. They won't listen. Have you ever been talking to someone and you try to give them the facts and they shut you down? I mean, has that ever happened? Yeah? Happened to you? Why? They hate knowledge. That's why they're foolish. You try to tell them and they won't listen. You don't even get to say it. You don't even get the 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 uh, opportunity to share your point of view because they'll shut you down because they can't handle the truth, right? It's like it's, <laughs> it's like Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth, right? That's how they are. They won't they won't even listen to it. Um, wisdom seeks guidance. Foolishness refuses to listen or accept help. One of the things you guys don't want to be is self-wise. You want advice. You want to seek knowledge. You need to have multiple people, multiple sources of knowledge. Now, as much as I love you guys being my students and caring about my opinion, and you guys ask me questions and you um, some of my students and even former students will contact me and say, hey, Kendall, what are your thoughts on this? And I get that a lot, especially as dad used to get it more. But since dad dies, I'm starting to pick up. I'm sure Terry gets it more than me, where people are calling up Terry and saying, hey, what, what do you think? on?" You know, I get that. And that's cool. And I like providing that. But don't ever let me or Summit Theological Seminary be your only source of information. Um. For my undergraduate degree, my dad didn't have me go to Summit. Summit existed when I was in college. Why did he not have me do my Bible studies with him? Why did he send me off to Cincinnati? Because he wanted me to have multiple sources in my life. And that played out well for me because at the time, Cincinnati had good professors. So people like Johnny Presley, Jack Cottrell, uh, um, David Faust, Dan Dyke, they were able to pour wisdom into my life. And I had multiple sources and I learned things that dad wouldn't have taught me. And I heard people who opposed some of my dad's views and I had to decide for myself, do I agree with my dad or do I agree with these people? And I had to reason out my own views on things. And it forced me to listen to all sides of some arguments. Um, and so you want to seek guidance. Now, if you know a source is, is wrong about a whole bunch of stuff, you don't need to listen to it. You know, I'm not encouraging you to go to read Watchtower Society material when you know it's wrong and or to read what the Pope says when you know the Pope's wrong. Once you've discovered that Catholicism is incorrect, you don't need to listen to count him as a source anymore. I'm not telling you to listen to sources you know are bad. But I'm telling you, if you don't know whether a source is good or bad, discern it. Find it out. Listen to the different points of view so that you make sure that you're right on things. Um, one of the phrases my dad got, he had heard um, a Davy Crockett say it when he was a kid. He read a Davy Crockett quote, and dad lived by it, was make sure you're right, then go ahead. And that's what you guys need to do. You need to make sure, seek guidance. And you need to... Wisdom is externally sourced, not internally sourced, okay? You don't get wisdom naturally. You get wisdom from listening to God, from listening to parent figures, and from uh, the public appeal of God through Scripture. Wisdom is externally sourced, and so you need to seek guidance. One of the Proverbs we'll read later in the Bible is that when you make war, have many advisors. Have multiple people be input into your life. And when you're going to study, especially a controversial topic, especially listen to multiple sources, 
you find one of these cult leaders who comes up with weird ideas and then goes and leads a whole bunch of people astray, you're going to find a proud person who taught something that nobody else taught because they came to their own weird conclusion incorrectly and they didn't have enough other sources to lead them to wisdom. And so the devil was able to deceive them. And once their pride let them take that position, they would never back off of it. And they gathered followers after themselves. And that's one of the de ways the devil introduces false doctrine into the church is through these people who are proud and refuse to listen to or accept help. You cannot understand the Bible properly without the help of other people. Wisdom is externally sourced. Seek guidance. Number four, wisdom is evangelistic. Wisdom wants to go out and spread itself. It calls out in the city streets. It's not hidden. It's not lethargic. Now, notice what it says there. It says the complacency of the fool destroys them. Foolish people are complacent. When you find a church or an individual or people who are complacent in their faith, you have not found wise Christians. They're not acting in accordance with wisdom. Wisdom is evangelistic. If you don't want to share your knowledge, there is something wrong with you. In fact, you might not have the right knowledge. You might be wrong if you're complacent. Now, you might have the right doctrine and be complacent for other evil reasons. But I'm telling you, you're not acting out wisdom. You might know wisdom, but you're not living wisdom because there's a difference between knowing it and living it. There's a difference between knowing what integrity is and living with integrity. There's a difference between knowing what's right and living out what's right. Wisdom is where you live it. Wisdom isn't known. Wisdom is done. Write that down. Write that down. Wisdom isn't known. Wisdom is done. Well, Maybe we should rephrase it. Wisdom isn't known only, it's done. Or maybe you could put it this way. Wisdom is known when it is done. <laughs> but wisdom is action. Biblical wisdom isn't something you just know in your head. Biblical wisdom is something you act out. You're not wise till you live it. Okay? You're not wise when you know it. You're wise when you do it. And wisdom is evangelistic. And it spreads itself. And therefore, because wisdom does, wisdom repents. Foolishness is wayward. What leads to repentance? That's the wise way. What's going to lead you to turn from your sin? That's the wise choice. You're dating a girl. She's trying to tempt you to sleep with her. She doesn't have your morals and she wants to be sexually active. You're dating this girl. What's the wise thing to do? It's the thing that keeps you away from that temptation, which would be to break up with her. You got a girlfriend and she wants to become your wife. She's not tempting you to have sex, but she's tempting you to not go to church or she wants you to not go into the ministry or she wants you to do a job where you make lots of money, not where you make lots of converts. She's tempting you to not follow God. Dump her. The whatever is tempting you to sin, get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, once you're in a marriage, you can't dump her. You got to stay married. Um, but and it's gonna make your life a lot harder. That's why you shouldn't marry or even date somebody who doesn't benefit you spiritually. You guys want to know one of the ways I knew that I should marry Annie is because I was a better Christian dating her. She made me want to be a better Christian and live as a better Christian. She encouraged my prayer life. She encouraged my Bible study. She encouraged me to be righteous. Annie encouraged me to be a better man. And it was easier to do the right thing, not harder dating Annie. That's how. That's one of the ways I knew that she was. And, and she believed in ministry, wanted to be a part of ministry, and was excited that I did ministry. That's why I partnered with her. Because she helps me become a better version of myself. And... You need to choose the things that help you become a better version of yourself. If you got a job that takes you away from church and takes you away from Bible reading and takes you away from your spiritual development with God, get a new job. If you're around people that are dragging you away from Christ, leave them. 
Go find people who will draw you closer to Christ. You see, how do I know what to do? How do I know the wise choice to make? Because it leads you to repentance. Wisdom leads you to turn away from sin. Foolishness leads you to sin. And whatever is tempting you to sin is foolish for you to keep doing. If a person is tempting you to sin all the time, it's foolish to be around them. If a job is tempting you away from God, it's foolish to keep that job. Do what leads to repentance, not what leads to waywardness. That's how you tell foolish from wise. That's what Proverbs is telling us. What are the results of wisdom? If we're wise and we act with wisdom, what's going to happen? Look at this. God pours out his thoughts. After you make that first wise choice, okay, you're at a crossroad, okay? I can do the right thing or the wrong thing. And you decide, I'm going to do the wise thing. If you choose that wise choice, it leads to more wisdom. It leads to more knowledge, okay? Look at all the things that making wise choices needs to. It increases your respect for God. It makes you listen to others and to the appeal of God. It makes you seek guidance more. It makes you more evangelistic. It makes you repent. Well, that leads to more wisdom. God pours out his thoughts. You guys, if you will start putting into practice what we're learning in Proverbs, I won't give you knowledge. I mean, I can impart some knowledge, but that's weak. I'm telling you, if you start putting into practice what we learn in Proverbs, if you start seeking God's wisdom and you start seeking multiple sources of instruction and you start avoiding what drags you away to God and repenting and turning what turns you to God, if you do that with all of your heart, God's going to pour his thoughts into you. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen somebody who truly repents and how quickly they grow in Christ? You see, I've seen people very slowly mature in Christ because they're not seeking him. They're not acting with wisdom. But that's the thing is wisdom compounds itself. The more wise choices you make, the more wisdom is revealed to you. The more wise choices you make, the more wisdom is revealed to you. It compounds. It exponentially grows like wildfire. Do you want God to pour out his thoughts into you or no? You know, Albert Einstein said, I want to know the thoughts of God. Everything else is just details. <laughs> that's true. The thoughts of God, that's that's the real deal, man. That's the real wisdom. Um, and so if you'll pour out your thoughts, God will make his teachings known. He'll give you guidance because you're seeking it from many sources. And look what the benefits are. Safety, ease, and fearlessness. Some of you struggle with anxiety. And some of that anxiety would melt if you'd make wiser choices. I don't know why I have all this fear and all this anxiety. And I, I just feel like I'm constantly make wise choices. You're not repenting. There's something in your life. You probably know what it is. And if you don't pray and God will make it clear that you need to put into practice that you know you should be doing and you're not. You know, I just don't know why I feel so bad and I'm so fat and I'm so out of shape. Because you're eating junk food and you're not working out. If you eat healthy and you exercise your body and you get sleep, you're going to lose weight and feel so good. Trust me, as a formerly very fat person, I can speak to this. I lost like 50, at one point, 60 pounds. Now back down to 50 pounds. I need to lose another 10. I'm telling you, if you eat healthy and you exercise every day, and you have the wisdom to implement that habit in your life every day, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel so good. You're going to look better. You're going to feel better. You're, it's, it makes incredible difference. Uh, I had this motorcycle accident in, on July 14th. I had a, I wrecked my motorcycle in, out in Maryland when I was at Delmarva. And I couldn't work out for a month because my shoulder was so jacked up. I'm telling you what, I felt terrible. Now I'm back in the gym and I'm feeling good. Um, because I'm making good choices and it affects you. And if you want to safety, ease, and fearlessness in your life, you have to make wise choices. 
And when you do, it armors you, protects you, and shields you against the problems that are going around in the world. It shields you from the actions of Satan. It, the righteousness is like a breastplate, the Bible says. And you're shielded and you're guided, and it creates safety for you spiritually, ease. Jesus said, take on my yoke. In other words, follow me. Yoke yourself like two oxen in a yoke with me. Take my yoke on, and it's easy. Why? Because God does all the heavy lifting. When you follow Jesus, it's easier. And if you're like, oh, life is so hard. It's such a struggle. You need to figure out what you need to repent of. You need to figure out where, where you need to yoke yourself with Jesus and follow Jesus better. You need to learn about some wise choices you need to make. Because it removes a lot of the anxiety of life. What's the result of foolishness? Well, the results of foolishness are this. Number one, you'll be mocked by God. Mockers will be mocked. If you think you're wise and so smart and you go around mocking wisdom, the day is going to come when God mocks you. Disaster is going to come on you unexpectedly. You're not even going to see it coming because you're so blind and foolish. How many people died and woke up in Hades and were totally flabbergasted and shocked? Calamity is going to come on you. One problem after another. Distress. Trouble. You'll be killed and destroyed. Number one, because when you go against God and the wisdom with which he created this world, the world will destroy you. I mean, it's like, with God out even trying, he just set the world up to punish stupidity, foolishness. If you act foolish, um, nature will punish you. Um, if you live in sexual immorality, get ready for the monkey pox, right? Um, if you if you drink alcohol, get ready for health problems. Get ready for relationship problems. If you live against God's will, it's going to destroy you. It's going to kill you. Number one, because all creation is geared to do that. Number two, God will see to it personally. Uh, as Johnny Cash once wisely wrote that, uh, that sage of the 20th century, you can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time. But sooner or later, God will cut you down. And that's the truth. If you live a foolish life, you last for a little while. You might even, by the power of the devil and the prince of this world, prosper for a short little moment. But you're going to fall like a shooting star. And you're going to burn up as you come back in down to earth. Um, you'll be mocked. There'll be disaster, calamity, distress, unexpectedly, quickly. It'll be like instantaneous. One day... You're on top of the world. The next day, you're gone. Like, for a while, Jeffrey Epstein was getting away with the murder and was living it up in wealth and opulence and 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 abusing and destroying other people's lives. But he was rich and successful and by the world's standards, very successful. But then one day, is gone. He was destroyed. And now there's no change in it. His fate is set. He could cry out for help down there in Hades, but God's not going to listen. He's going to be judged based on what he did while in the body. And once you die, there's no change in it. For a short time while you're alive, you have the opportunity to change your fate. There comes a time where it's sealed and you're destroyed. If you keep running on and running on and running on away from God, He's going to cut you down. And that's just how it is. Okay, we're going to take our break. And uh, then we'll come back and we'll start in on chapter two and see if we can, I don't know if we can do it, see if we can get through chapter two in our third hour. And then we'll done first online Proverbs class in the books. So uh, take a five minute break and we'll come back. And if you got any questions, let me know.
There we are. Thank you, little lady. Okay, screen share. Okay. Are we good? We can all see. And we're recording. Thank you, whoever just told me that we're not recording, because I would have been so mad if I had recorded this hour. Okay. Um, we're in Proverbs chapter two, and we're gonna realize that Proverbs is intentional. Write this down. Um Proverb, uh, wisdom is intentional, not accidental. Nobody was ever wise on accident. No one ever went, oops, I accidentally became wise. No, it doesn't work that way. Wisdom is on purpose, okay? So if you don't mean to become wise, you won't. Uh, the old saying is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And if you don't plan and then execute, the search of wisdom, you will not be. If you want to be simple and stay up there on the surface and not dive deep into wisdom, if you want to stay there and be simple-minded and not rise to the heights, depths, and widths of wisdom, you can just keep listening to your heart. You see, the advice to listen to your heart, that's the worst advice ever. Because the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it, the Bible says. Uh, your, your, your own gut reactions will often be not wise if you haven't been trained. Now, if you listen to lots of advice and you get lots of wisdom and you externally source wisdom and you have lots of sources of knowledge and input and insight, then yes, then your gut reactions will be correct. But you can't have those kind of wise initial knee-jerk reactions if you haven't trained yourself in wisdom. Wisdom is intentional. All right, let's 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 listen to chapter two, verses one through eight. Let's not take my word for it. Let's see what Solomon has to say. My son, if you accept my words, notice the if means it's conditional. If upon the condition of you accepting my words and store up my commands within you, so you store them up, you memorize them, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight, hey, give me advice. <laughs> you cry out aloud for understanding. And if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. One of my favorite places to go uh, is Silverton, Colorado. I love it out west. I love the San Juan Mountains. They call it the American Alps. And, and it is like that. I remember the first time I went up one of the 12,000, 13,000 foot uh, passes in a jeep i got out of my jeep and looked and i just couldn't help but standing on the edge of the mountain and calling out Ricola! because it's just like that it's just um it's like the swiss alps um it, it's it's beautiful and um but the reason those roads are there and those old uh ghost towns and mining towns are there is because one time there were silver in them there hills there's a reason that silverton colorado is named silverton colorado because they mined silver out of there and they built these roads one of the guys when i was there for uh um this week uh, it's like a men's camp that they have in july up in eureka colorado and i was speaking there and they go up and they hike up in the mountains and we hike up to this path to this little shack that was a mine and i tell you what you had to be part billy goat to, i was a near-death experience for me but anyway you're way up there and the reason they're up there above you know, all semblance of a tree line and you're struggling to breathe. And you, the reason those little paths are there and those buildings are there is somebody was mining for silver and it's not easy to get. You have to go up in the mountains and then dig down in the mountain. And I, I went down in one of the old silver mines and dropped down a mile below. And it is insane how on this elevator going down into this mine and it was just craziness. And that kind of uh, effort was put in just to get silver because it was so rare and so precious and you have to have that kind of attitude for wisdom that you're going to go to the highest heights or dig to the deepest depths or walk the treacherous path whatever it takes to find wisdom it is intentional you got to dig for it you got to mountain climb for it you've got to work for it no one with the path to wisdom isn't easy it's not. And um, 
you, it has to be an intentional choice. Look at verse six, for the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk as blameless for he guards the course of the just and he protects the way of his faithful ones. So wisdom is intentional. Number one, you must accept it willingly. God gives it. Fathers give it. Parents give it. The word of God gives it. Preachers give it. Sunday school teachers give it. Teachers give it. Friends give it. Wise people give it. But you have to accept it. Wisdom is a choice. You can choose to be wise or choose not to be. You don't even have to have a high IQ. All you have to do is have the willing heart. Wisdom can come to anybody. Good news is you don't have to have IQ, high IQ to be wise. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be blessed. You don't have to come from good parents. Anyone can become wise if they put that intention in their life and they live out that intention. You must accept it willingly. You must store it up within you. You can't just read it once and go, well, I got it. You got to store it up. You got to memorize it. You got to repeat it. You got to intentionally store it. Um, if you don't store it up, you won't have it in reserve. If you want to be a good husband someday, most of y'all are single. Well, study how to be a good husband now so you got that stored up. Study how to be a good parent now so you got that stored up. Study about how to go to heaven now so that you got that ready for when the day comes when Jesus comes back. Store it up like an ant stores up food for the winter. Like a squirrel stores up nuts. Store it up like your grandma with the canned vegetables from her garden so that she has corn and potatoes in January because she stored it up. Like the retiree who's got plenty of money to live on after he quits working. Store it up. Store up wisdom. You must turn your ear to it. Say what? Say that again. Listen. You've got to be listening on purpose. You're in a situation where there's a whole bunch of people talking, and but you want to hear what one particular person is saying. And so you're like, you know, cry, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Huh? See, there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of foolish voices and a lot of deceptive voices and a lot of other things being said. And you have to turn your ear. You got to focus and concentrate on wisdom. You got to accept it, store it up, turn your ear to it, and you've got to apply it to your heart. It's not enough to have it up here. It's got to go down here. I'm, I, can't, I can't emphasize it enough. It can't just be up here. It has to go down here. You got to store it in your heart. There has to be an emotional reaction and attachment to wisdom. You have to care. You have to want it. Um, things that you are passionate about are the things you're about. There are things that you know because you had to learn them in school. The things you do because you're forced to do them, but your heart ain't in it. If you want to become wise, though, your heart has to be in it. You have to care. And you have to call out for it. If you refuse to ask questions, if you refuse to seek advice, if you refuse to read books on it, if you refuse to do research on the internet, if you refuse to listen to multiple sources, if you refuse to call out and say, I need help, I don't understand this, I don't get this, then you're just, you're not going to be wise. My dad always used to give this quote, and I believe it was originally from Charles Spurgeon. If I'm remembering, I'm from remember right, it's Charles Spurgeon. He said, he who ne never reads other people's writings will never be read. And he who never quotes others will never be quoted. Until you learn from others, you can't teach others. Not the truth anyway. Until you learn the truth from others, you can't teach the truth to others. You have to call out for it. Now, all of you are already on a good track. You're going to Summit Theological Seminary. You're getting multiple uh, professors and teachers and points of view. You're hearing from Shane. You're hearing from Jerry Paul. You're hearing from Terry. You're hearing from uh, my brother, Jeff, uh, Dale Holtzbauer. 
all these different people are speaking into your life. And that's right there. That's a wide swath of very different men. <laughs> so that's good. You're getting multiple. But even beyond Summit and beyond, um, I think, Chris, right now you're trying to get influence from Derek and from Kirk. That's good. They're wise guys. Multiple in source sources of input. And, and someday you're going to step away from Kirk and Derek. Someday you're going to step away from Summit. Get new ones, Chris. Don't stop with us. Always have men and sources and books and authors that are feeding into your life. And the rest of you, the same thing. I'm telling you, uh, you know, have multiple sources of insight, many, many advisors and cry aloud for it. Sometimes the answers won't be easy and people won't know you get, you got to cry out to God. Oh God, I can't figure this out. God, I don't know what to do. God help me. And sometimes it's about praying to God and crying out. Someone help me with this. Look, talk to people about what you're struggling with. You say, well, some of it might be very personal, very private. It's a personal sin problem or a personal emotional problem. Some, Undoubtedly, all of you probably have some personal spiritual issues that are going on in your life. Look, man, you got to find somebody to talk to about that stuff. You need somebody you trust, somebody that's godly. You need to cry out for help. James chapter two says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so you might be healed. If you don't ever have anybody that you can talk to about your weaknesses, dude, you're going to be so lost. You're going to be so helpless. How can you improve when you don't do what the Bible says to do and you don't confess your struggles to somebody and have somebody pray for you and advise you? How do you expect to be wise when you're not doing what the scripture says? And all of us, I, you, we all need this. It's not, well, it is weakness, but it's not any more weak than anyone else. We are weak and, and we need God's help and we need other people's help. That's why God gave us the church. He gave us each other to help each other along the way. And we have to cry out for help. And if you won't say, hey, I'm hurting. Hey, I'm lost here. Hey, I'm lonely here. Hey, I'm... I need help to know what to do here. You're not going to get the help. Squeaky wheel gets the oil, brother. And you got to squeak. Um, and you must look for it as a valuable thing. You must value silver. And if you want to go digging for it. And then you got to dig. There's a four-letter word that keeps a lot of people from wisdom. W-O-R-K work you got to dig you got to you got to survey and see where the silver's hidden get an idea where it is and then dig 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 read 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 study 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 some answers don't come easy some of what you need to be the husband the father the the leader the evangelist the christian the prayer the bible student the worker the man of character and integrity that you need to be it's buried and you got to dig for it because the world has piled all its crap on top of it. Now the path there is there. You can find it. If you'll do the little thing and repent of what you're struggling with now, if you'll get help, if you have many advisors, if you'll listen to a father and mother figure, if you listen to God's word, he'll guide you. There's a way of escape. There's a way to it. There's treasure to be found. It's out there. But, it often comes through work. And only if you value wisdom will you find it. If you don't value it, you're not going to come upon it. You must search for it as for, for a hidden treasure. And until you treasure the wisdom of God, if you, until you value the thoughts of God, he's not going to pour them into your heart. If he gives you some wisdom, and he has, he's given each one of you some wisdom. If you won't implement that, if you won't follow that, if you won't treasure what he has given you, if you don't put it in your mind and memorize it, if you don't store it up within you, if you don't uh, turn your ear to it, if you're not going, what'd you say, God? Say that again, Lord. If you're not putting it in your heart, if you're not caring about it, if you're not treasuring it and hiding that away in your heart so that you don't sin against God, he's not going to give you more. If you give a little kid uh, a toy and he immediately breaks the toy, 
You give him another one. He breaks that one. You're not giving him a third toy. Not till he learns to value stuff. You're not going to give a kid something he doesn't value that he destroys immediately. And if you don't value wisdom and you don't put into practice what God is telling you, he's not going to give you more. I'm going to silence my phone because it's for some reason deciding to make all kinds of beepy noises. Um, wisdom is intentional. And wisdom is knowable. Proverbs 2, 9 through 11. When will you understand what is right, just and fair, every good path? For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom's knowable. You can accept it. You can store it. You can turn your ear to it. You can apply it. You can call for it, cry aloud for it, look for it, search for it, and you'll find it. If you seek, you will find. If you ask, you will receive. If you knock, the door will be opened. Seek and you'll find fear of the Lord and knowledge of God. You'll understand what is right. Every good, just, fair, good path. If you look for it, if you dig deep, if you seek many advisors, if you look for God's will and God's wisdom, he'll give it. If you'll put into practice, if you'll hide it in your mind, if you'll hide it in your heart, if you'll treasure it, if you turn your ear towards it, if you search for it desperately, you call out for it, you pray for it, you beg God for it, you ask others to help you find it, you will find it and it'll be, you'll know what's right and what's just and what's fair. You'll know every good path. When wisdom is sought, it'll enter your heart and it'll be pleasant. When you're doing what God wants and you know you're doing what God wants and you're dead square in the center of God's will, doing God's will feels good. When you're on the right path and you're seeing and you're knowing you're doing the right thing, you're grounded and rooted in God's word, fed and nourished, built up and strengthened, solidified, standing firm. Ah, so pleasant. Happiness can come from sin for a short while, but joy, peace, contentment, security. Ah, it melts away fears comes from when you know I'm on a mission from God. I'm doing what he wants. I'm seeking his will and he's revealing his wisdom to me. And you see it, you see it fall into place and it, it enters in your heart and he pours out wisdom upon wisdom on you. Ah, it feels good. It's pleasant. It's the good path. It's the pleasant path because wisdom is knowable. Got good news for you guys. You can be wise. Every one of you, there's not one of you listening to me right now that can't be wise. You've made foolish choices in the past, me too, but you can be wise. If you're not, you can become wise. If you are, you can become wiser still. You can grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It's doable. You got this because when you see God and you start implementing his wisdom, it compounds, it multiplies. He starts pouring his knowledge and wisdom into you. The more you use it, the more you get, the more you get, the more he gives, the more he gives, the more peace you have, the more pleasant your life is. Even with all the crap and chaos around you, you'll weather the storm because Wisdom is knowable and wisdom is beneficial. Uh, verse 12 through 15. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from those whose words are perverse. Wow. Wicked men will try to harm you guys, but you'll be saved if you follow wisdom. Um, it'll save you from those who leave the straight paths and walk in dark ways who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways, 
the tricksters, the con artists, the 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 wicked people. They'll defeat him. Well, what else will it save us from, Kendall? Well, let me tell you. Verse 16 through 20. This is one you boys want saved from big time. Because she's coming for you. She's coming for each one of you guys. It will save you from the adulteress. From the wayward wife with her seductive words. Who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. For her house leads down to death. Her paths and spirits to the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Wisdom is beneficial. Why? Number one, it's from God. Wisdom and understanding come from the mouth of God, it said. Where does wisdom come from? Where is it sourced? From God. It comes from the ultimate source of wisdom is God. And what's it do? What is wisdom making? It makes you upright and blameless. How? It shields your walk, it guards your course, and it protects you via faithfulness. See, when you walk the path of God, the devil can't get you. He'll try. Oh, he'll, he'll try. He'll try to knock you off course. But as long as you keep it between the lines, guys, the devil can't get you. Oh, he can cause you problems. He can break your heart. He can destroy things around you. He can cause all kinds of physical, emotional, and relational heartache. But he can't touch your spirit and your soul. He can't damn you. He can't take you from heaven. And he cannot destroy your whole life or take away your usefulness. He can't take away the security the true success of your life, which is your significance, where you make a significant contribution to the eternal consequences of this world, uh, to other souls. He can't take away your significance or your soul when you walk the path because he shields you and he guards you. And he gives understanding. When you follow wisdom and you seek for wisdom, you'll get an understanding of what's right and just, fair and good, and a protective discretion and understanding. He'll give you insight to guard you against the lies of the devil the devil will shoot his flaming arrows of temptation but your shield of faith will extinguish them you see when you follow wisdom you're protected this is why you need to seek wisdom as like hidden treasure that's why it's more valuable than any gold or silver or anything else wisdom is immensely valuable because it protects your spiritual life <laughs> wisdom is beneficial It'll save you from evil ways of the wicked. What evil ways? Perverse words, deceptive philosophies and teachings, from crooked paths, from dark ways, from evil desires, from perverseness, from deviousness, from adultery, from seductive words, from death. That's a lot. Look what wisdom's benefits. It keeps you from when people try to pervert the word of God, when they take a crooked way, a dark way, an evil desires. When the devil tries to play on your evil desires, think about Jesus. When the devil came and tempted him with evil desires, the word of God and the way of wisdom protected Jesus from the devil and kept him on the right path. It changes your walk. It teaches you to follow good men and it teaches you to follow paths of righteousness. So you're protected because you're walking in the way of the wise. These good godly men and women who've gone on before you, you're following them. The paths of righteousness laid out in scripture, what the Bible calls the straight and narrow, you're on it. And it protects you. It changes your walk based on who you follow. And it gives you an internal inheritance. It stores up victory. Okay? So wisdom might not give you immediate victory. But if it doesn't, it's going to give you deferred victory or stored up victory. So sometimes wisdom's benefits are not immediate. I'll say it again. Sometimes wisdom's benefits are not immediate. But once you get them, they're eternal. <laughs> wisdom's benefits are not always immediate, but they are eternal. What? A, how? Well, you have an upright life you can live. That's immediate. Um, you become blameless and will remain. Okay, that's a benefit. The wicked are cut off from around you. Okay, that'll happen someday when Jesus comes back. And the unfaithful are torn away. 
these people who try to do you harm, you don't need to take vengeance because God's going to. You don't need to uh, get rid of them because God's going to get rid of them. God's going to fight for you. He's going to give you an internal inheritance. So the benefits of wisdom are eternal. If you live for short-term pleasure, you'll sin. If you live for long-term benefits, you'll be wise. So, summary. Um, no one was ever accidentally wise. It must, I even capitalized the word must just for you. It must be sought for like treasure, pursued like a beautiful woman, and longed for like daily food, and thirsted after as a deer pants for water. Not uh, only the sincere seeker does wisdom seem pleasant. So if you're a sincere seeker of God, wisdom will seem pleasant to you. If you're a fool, wisdom will seem very unpleasant. Going to church is a burden to the fool and a blessing to the righteous. Sexual purity is a burden to the fool and a blessing to the righteous. Prayer is a blessing to the wise and a waste of time to the fool. See, the way something comes across to you is based on whether you're wise or foolish. Um. And therefore, uh, to the fool, wisdom seems like a drudgery with no benefit. Because they're living for short-term pleasure, not long-term results. And that's why they don't pursue it. But when you know the value, you pursue it. By the way, wisdom is compared to a wife or a woman here. Notice how wisdom was called she. Did you notice that? Um, the personification of wisdom as a woman is repeated. Um, turn on your sound for a second, because I'd like you guys to interact with me on this. What are some ways you think that that chasing after wisdom is like chasing after a woman? We're going to talk more to about get. this. I'm sorry, what? Hard to get. Hard to get. Very good. What else? <laughs> Build, building off of what he said, it's hard to get, but once you get it and you get the right wisdom, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Very beneficial. What else? How else is wisdom? It's compared to a woman. Why? And, and we'll talk more about this as the book goes on, because there's lots of the same comparison. But how else? And talk about specifically the pursuit of wisdom to the pursuit of a woman. So, Kendall, you said something that uh, drew you to Annie was because she made you a better Christian. What we should be looking at in wisdom is, am I becoming a better person as I'm becoming more wise? Am I becoming more like God? Wisdom comes from God. So as I become more wise, I become more like him. I come closer to him. And if something is not drawing you closer to God, it's not wise. <laughs> That's, that is, so um, from, the ben from the benefits, you can see it. But like, um, okay, Josh, you've gotten married. Are, are you the only one married here? No, no, Boomer's married. Did you spend any money, Josh and Boomer, when you courted your wife? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, is it most one of the most expensive things you ever pursued? Yes, but it's worth it. Yes. Okay. That's great. So mm -hmm. she's the pearl of great. Hey, price. Kendall. Hey, Kendall. <laughs> yeah. So what, what you're saying, what you're saying is it's something that you're willing to sacrifice for. Right. And you're willing mm -hmm. to go to great lengths. Like I'm moving to Louisiana. Do you think Louisiana is where I wanted to live? I mean, the food's great. There's some sweet people, but no, I'm not into mosquitoes and alligators. Uh, I'm moving here because I want to minister to her and her, her sons. And, you know, you do things, you give up things, you sacrifice things for the greater good. And I really believe the greater good is for me to live here. And so that's why I'm, I've made these choices to pursue wisdom. You've got to give some stuff up. You've got to seek, you've got to sacrifice. 
and you've got to go. I've spent a small fortune, boys, flying back and forth to Louisiana and Mexico. I mean, it's obscene how many motorcycles could have been purchased with what I've spent on uh, flights. Um, and that's because I value her. A lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort required to court, win the heart of, and marry Annie Fall. So it is with wisdom. With, pursuing wisdom is like pursuing a woman. That's not an analogy I made. That's an analogy the Bible makes. And it makes it again and again in the book of Proverbs. And I think the reason God does this is probably nothing more that a man does in pursuit of that he gives himself more to. I mean, you take her into your mind, but not just that. You take her into your heart when you pursue a woman. And that's the way wisdom must be. And just like you can't marry her and then forget her and cheat on her, you can't cheat on wisdom. Just like you have to be faithful to a woman or she'll leave you, you've got to be faithful to wisdom or wisdom will leave you. Wisdom's like a woman. That's why the Bible... So I had someone just the other day ask me, Kendall, why is wisdom compared to a woman rather than to God and a man? And they're like, they're trying to understand why. Because wisdom is something you've got to seek like a woman. It's That's the comparison. Is It's always about how you seek in wisdom is like a woman. And uh, last in our summary here. Uh, oh, by the way, to the person who loves his wife, finding her is very pleasant to him. But somebody who doesn't like a wife to be married, if I was married to some guy's wives, that would be drudgery. If if my only option was to marry some of the wives I've seen men married to, I would choose a life of singlehood. It took me nine years uh, to remarry again after uh, my divorce. And it wasn't because there weren't other women to marry. It's because there weren't any women I wanted to marry. <laughs> and uh, um, when you find the right woman, it's not drudgery. It's not it's not drudgery for me to hang out with Annie. It's not drudgery for me to spend money on her or spend time with her. It's a pleasure, not drudgery, because I love her. And when you really find real wisdom, it's not a drudgery to you. But if you don't love wisdom, if you love yourself, if you love pleasure, if you love sin, if you love evil, wisdom will seem like the worst wife in the world. And they will not understand why you're living the way you're living. Christianity will not make sense to a fool. They won't get it. They can't because they value different things. Okay, wisdom shields, protects, guards, it stores up for an inevitable victory in the end. Foolishness is a short-term gain that doesn't last and causes an eternal loss. Do you guys see the difference? Wisdom shields and protects and guards while it stores up for an inevitable victory and blessing in the end. Whereas foolishness is the short-term gain of pleasure, but it doesn't last. And in the end, it damns you to death and hell, causes eternal loss. So is sin fun? Yeah, for a little while, till it isn't. And then it sucks. It's the worst. It's hell. And so uh, as we summarize uh, chapter one and two, I, I hope that you will see that wisdom is externally sourced, that it must be sought that you receive it from God, from father, mother figures, and from his public call in scripture. And you've got to look for it. You've got to hunt for it like a woman, like buried treasure, like silver and gold, um, and value it. You've got to hide it away. You've got to be faithful to it. Uh, you got to sacrifice to get it. It takes work. But if you'll seek it, God will give you more and more, and it'll shield you, protect you, and guard you while you store up blessing after blessing for eternal life. That's the difference. Wisdom is long-term goals. Foolishness is short-term pleasure. Wisdom is on the surface. It's simple. I mean, not wisdom. Foolishness is on the surface and it's simple. And it appeals to immediate desires of the flesh. Wisdom appeals to greater things, 
to eternal things, to eternal purposes, and to eternal blessings. Wisdom's long-term, foolishness is short-term only. All right? So questions. Um, wisdom's attentional. What are you doing to purposely find wisdom? It's a rhetorical question. You don't got to answer. But it's a question that you better answer. You better know because you don't get it by accident. Not one of you. And you could say, well, I'm taking this class. Well, that's a good answer. Good. But beyond this class, this class is temporary. What habit are you putting in your life that's going to be forever? Yeah, for the next 17 weeks, you're going to be forced to read Proverbs every day, to write down a proverb and write a little paragraph on a proverb that speaks to you. Like you're going to be forced to find something in chapter 25 tonight that speaks to you and write me a little paragraph about what you learned from that proverb. Um, but beyond this class, what habit are you going to put into your life that gives you wisdom every day? What are you going to implement in your life that goes beyond this short 16, 17 week class that's going to transform your permanent seeking of wisdom what are you doing to purposely find it day in day out all of your life number two it's knowable what are you doing that shows you believe you can know more if wisdom is knowable and you can gain more and you can know more and more wisdom and it's infinite it's there's no end to the amount of wisdom you can gain what are you doing daily that shows you believe you can know more wisdom. And three, wisdom is beneficial. What are you doing that shows the benefits of wisdom in your life? Stupid is as stupid does. What are you doing, stupid, that shows you're wise? Hey, hey everybody, hold on. This is my this is my uh my son. This is Daniel. This is Annie's youngest. He's nine years old. Say wave it, wave hi to everybody. Hi. Hey, I got to finish this class about five minutes. Give me about five minutes. I'll be out to see you, all right? Okay. Good to see you, buddy. Um, he just got home from school. <laughs> all right. So wisdom is beneficial. What are you doing that shows the benefits of wisdom? Here? There has to be something that shows the value of the wisdom you've already sought and implemented in your life. And if you can't point to, here's a benefit here. I'm not, I'm not sleeping around with a bunch of women. I'm not getting drunk. Uh, I'm not in trouble with the law. Uh, I have a good relationship with my parents. Um, I'm, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, I'm kind. I, you know, there should be some fruit of wisdom in your life already that hopefully, I mean, you're all Christians. You should already implemented some wisdom in your life. So there should be the fruit of it. Where's the proof? You should be able to point to some things in your life. If you're just like everybody else, if you're like every other you know, 20 something young man looking at porn, sleeping around, uh, getting drunk, uh, listening to wicked music, playing video games and not doing nothing with your life. How are you? How are you any different? Where's the where's the evidence of wisdom in your life? So there should be some evidence. And those are questions I want you to ask yourself. Um, because this class isn't about just getting a, a good grade in this class. This class is about implementing wisdom in your life. And what are you doing to, to, to find it? What shows and proves that you believe that you need and can get more of it? And what are you doing that shows the benefits of it in your life? Because wisdom is intentional, knowable, and beneficial. If that's true, how is that played out in your life? All right. So we got through everything I wanted to get through today. I wanted to get through the introduction, chapter one and chapter two. Woo! Awesome. Do you guys have any questions on what we covered? Okay, I will be in contact with you this week because I'm probably going to have you do something uh, to, uh, I don't know how I'm going to have you do it. I'm gonna, there's some way I want to uh, make sure that you're covering the material in dad's, um, dad's book each week too, but we'll get back with that. But um, I'm not doing quizzes, so I'm not going to make you study the material and take quizzes on that so the proof to me that you're studying the 
the stuff, the material is you're going to read the chapter, uh, pick out one proverb from that chapter that you read from the day and write me a little paragraph of what that taught you. You know, this proverb means to me. And then, you know, and it, I'm talking a couple, few sentences, three, four sentences is all I need. And um, if it's a little longer because it really spoke to you, okay, but please let's not make like two paragraphs, just one paragraph of what that, what that proverb meant to you have mercy on me i gotta read all these and uh turn that in digital format uh to my email um by next week you all have my email right kindle underscore fall.mail.com it'll be you should have all received an email from me and you should have all received uh you all got my 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 text uh, number my phone if you ever got a question or you have any concern or any problems or whatever i can get hold of you that way I'm going to try to make uh, some sort of text group chat thing so I can text all of you that way if there's ever an issue um, of, you know, that I can't do the class or we have to postpone something that I can contact you all. We shouldn't be. Uh, we should be able to do this, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, again, any questions over what we've covered so far? Let me sh shut this off. Okay. Well, um, I hope that you enjoyed today's lesson and I look forward to getting to know you guys better. Some of you that I don't know, uh, and, uh, um, and covering this material, it, it just gets better and better. It's really, really a powerful book. I love, uh, teaching this class because, uh, it is so much fun for me to teach it. All right. Well, if there's anything else, I'll pray and we'll be on our way. Father in heaven, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you that we can choose to be wise, that it doesn't depend on our IQ, it doesn't depend on our upbringing and our background or what our parents were like or what anybody else chooses. It's our choice, Lord. We can choose to seek and find wisdom and implement it in our life. Thank you, God, for giving us that choice. You didn't have to, but through your word, you, you offered it to us. And in grace, you've given us what we don't deserve, an opportunity to become wise. And Lord, I'm so thankful that we can we can do it, that it's knowable, that our little peewee brains, you've made it palatable so that we can become wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that we can follow the good path, that we can be protected from powerful uh, deception of Satan and the, the prince of this world and the powers and forces of evil in heavenly places. Lord, you have given us power over demonic forces through your wisdom. And we praise you and we thank you that it's that we can seek it, that we can know it, and that it can transform our lives and that it's beneficial. Thank you, God, for all the benefits of wisdom in our life and, and the wonderful uh, fruit of wisdom that we reap and feast upon and feed upon and are protected by and, and for the pleasantness of it, for the joy of it, for the, the goodness of your ways and, and for the eternal benefits that are beyond our imagination. Oh, Lord, God, we praise you and thank you for wisdom. And um, we thank you for the cross of Jesus that makes it possible. We love you, God. Help us to hide that wisdom away in our minds and hearts and to put it into practice. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. Love you guys. And uh, if you need anything, let me know. Uh, I will catch you guys around. All right. Thanks, Kendall. Adios.